In this class, we are going to look at the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms or the Heptarchy. In the last class, we had already seen the Anglo-Saxon kingdom consisted of seven regions or seven kingdoms. So together they are known as the Heptarchy. So we already know which are they, what were they, where were they, you can locate them on the map, right? So again we'll be taking a look at the seven kingdoms. So the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. So we have already seen in the map of Britain of that time that how the Angles, the Saxons and the Jews, they settled into different well-marked areas of the land. That is, they did not kind of mix and settle here and there as such. Certain areas were well-marked, well-marked, and they established their kingdoms in those regions. And when you look at these kingdoms, they all were not friendly with each other. Most of the time, they were into fighting, they were into warring with each other. And then slowly, you can say they all settled and they developed an identity, an identity of their own identity of a particular uh, kingdom. So ultimately they all settled down and then these different kingdoms, the seven different kingdoms, strong kingdoms are known as the Heptarchy. We have already seen how the Angles had settled in the regions known as North Anglia, Mercia and East Anglia, whereas the Saxons, they settled in the areas known as Essex, Wessex and Sussex. Whereas the Jews, the first of these lot, they settled in this region called Kent. What we need to remember when we are talking about the Heptarchy is that different kings and different kingdoms, they rose into prominence under different ages. And it depended, depended upon the ability of its leader. So, for instance, if Northumbria had a very strong leader, a strong king, obviously, North Empire would become the dominant, the dominating kingdom of the seven. So as you look at history, you can see along the ages, you find different kingdoms becoming prominent. This is to say that not all of them were powerful at the same time. So every kingdom had its day under the sun. So the map is here, we have Turkey. Here you have North Anglia, Mercia, and East Anglia of the Angles. Then you have Wessex, Sussex, and Essex ruled by the Saxons. And here you have the uh, small kingdom of Kent, which was under the Duke. The same uh, kind of map. So now it's a detailed picture of the kingdom of Kent. The map of Kent, you don't have to really worry about that. You just see Kent is in the small southern <clears throat> most corner of Britain. You can see this is their insignia, that is um, the kind of emblem they used on their flags and all. Right? And uh, so it, they were the first ones to come, Jews, right? So obviously that was the first powerful kingdom. So this was powerful around the 6th century AD. So 6th century AD was all about the kingdom of Kent and the Jews. So this was the first powerful kingdom. And King Ethelbert, he was recognized as the overlord by the other kings. So the other kingdoms were there, but they were not that very strong. And as a result, what happened? Uh, these uh, other kings, uh, the Saxon kings and the Angle kings, they considered the king of uh, Kent, the king of Kent as in King Ethelbert as their overlord. So he was the king of kings, something like an emperor. And uh, this uh, time is also the time of the arrival of Christianity, official arrival of Christianity. We, we have already seen how Christianity had already come during the time of the Romans, right? So the official arrival of Christianity happened under King Ethelbert of Kent. Why? Because his wife Bertha, she was a very devout Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and uh, she brought. I mean, she was a Christian, so she converted her husband also to Christianity. And you have the coming of Saint Augustine and this group of forty monks to England during this time. 
so you have the setting up some setting up of seminaries and then slowly uh, the conversion many people getting converted into christianity so the official arrival of christianity is dated to the 6th century under the kingdom of kent and uh, the power of kent declined with the death of ethelbert in 616 ad so the uh, so the kingdom of kent had a very short run at power and that was mainly because of this particular king king ethelbert moving on to the next kingdom of prominence we have the kingdom of northumbria that's in the 7th century so you can see their flag there and northumbria is here the long longish uh, kind of a piece of land and the, the first powerful king was ethelfert he had uh, defeated the scottish people and you can see they share the border with scotland here right so this whole region is northumbria so here it's almost kind of scotland so he had defeated the, the scots and then you have the next king edwin he converted to christianity so again northumbria also became christian so the king converting to christianity obviously you will have how uh, many of the citizens also converting to christianity his uh, successors were kings uh, called the oswald and oswy and uh, one major thing that had happened during the uh, during the time when northumbria was in power was this synod of whitby in 664 ad we will be doing this in detail later so this united the celtic and the saxon christians now what is a synod a synod is a, a gathering a kind of a meeting of the church wherein you have the church elders sitting and deciding upon certain things certain uh, matters of importance or prominence So there was this synod which united the Celtic and the Saxon Christians, and Celtic uh, Christians are those uh, in, in Wales as well as Ireland. So there was some kind of a division, and also all that was uh, kind of nullified, and the Celtic and the Saxon Christians were united after the synod of Whitby. And another important contribution of this kingdom in the seventh century was in the field of literature because they produced this. very very famous uh, writer he was a priest he is called the venerable bede venerable bede he is the first english historian he had put down the history of britain of that time into writing he has written this ecclesiastical history of england so he is a priest so that was one great contribution and the other one was this uh, poet called cadman so he is considered to be the first english poet then coming to the 8th century you have the kingdom of mercia which sits in the middle of britain coming into prominence prominence so mercia also became christian in faith and uh, some important kings of note from the region are king uh, ethelbert and offa and offa was able to uh, defeat and uh, subdue the welsh and if you remember the uh, the welsh is to the uh, left side of mercia so he was able to uh, kind of contain them uh, he, he was able to protect uh, the boundary from the welsh people and uh, offa he built this very long ditch from river wye to river dee which is called offa's dyke so it it is uh, somewhere along the border of uh if you could say mercia and this is wales right so somewhere here he was able to build this huge ditch uh, remains of which remain even today it's called offa's uh, dyke and he was able to contain the welsh into their region so in that way mercia became quite powerful in the 8th century so this is their flag insignia and coming to the 9th century you have the kingdom of wessex coming into prominence so now this is the flag of the kingdom of wessex so here you have king egbert defeating mercia there was a battle called the battle of elendune in 825 ad so with the defeat of mercia wessex became the center of power it became the powerhouse so along with mercia uh this kingdom of wessex 
it had vassal kingdoms vassal kingdoms are other kingdoms that pay taxes and obeisance to a particular kingdom so it had all these kingdoms under wessex and which were the kingdoms under wessex mercia kent sussex and northumbria so you can imagine how powerful wessex was so wessex was so powerful that it had all, almost all the other anglo saxon kingdoms under it so the other kings they paid respect as well as some kind of taxes some kind of money to wessex and uh, king egbert he also defeated the danes danes uh, these are danish people we'll be talking about them in the coming classes so when these people came danes as in the vikings when they came he was able to defeat them so he, they were like a common enemy and this happened in the battle of hengist down in 836 so it was not easy for the danes to come and easily walk into anglo saxon England mainly because of the king called Egbert from the kingdom of Wessex and after that you have the next king king Alfred the great you might have heard of his name he he defeated the danes and he integrated them into the nation so he defeated the danes we'll be looking into that part of the history also in another class and how Wessex uh, went on to become the greatest of all these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and from there you have the growth and development of the English nation as we know today. We'll be looking at that in the coming classes. So here you have the picture of Heptarchy once again for you to have a look at.